An Ordered Life Chapter 1 Ancestry Heeding the Call of Moses Deuteronomy 8 2 I have sought to remember all the way that Je Jehovah my God has led me these twice forty years. The review causes me to exclaim with Addison When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with the view I am lost in wonder, love, and praise. And with him I recognize that unnumbered comforts on my soul thy tender care bestowed, before my infant heart conceived, from whom those comforts flowed. The only authentic information concerning my family in early times, in earlier times, is that its original head was tenant of a particularly attractive property on a large and well-ordered estate and was especially favoured by the noble owner. But being discovered in, al in alliance with an implacable enemy of his landlord, detected, in fact, as lawyers would say, in flagrant delicto, in the very act he was summarily ejected, together with his wife, who in truth had led him open-eyed into such folly. He was thus reduced to the level of a common field labourer, and the ill effects of his ingratitude and misconduct have dogged the footsteps of each and of his descendants unto this day. Their names were, of course, Adam and Eve. Nor have I much to say of my immediate forebears. forebears. My revered father told me that two great-aunts of my mother, Amelia Helen Hayes were joint heirs with their brother of certain market garden in what is now the Clapham area of southwest London. These lands, therefore, had become, in my mother's time, of no small value for good residential properties. But the brother had defrauded the sisters of their stature, of their share. Their lawyer said he could easily be forced to surrender, but that in the process, he would, they would get him hanged, for he had forged a signature, for which crime, even so comparatively recently, the penalty was death. So the sisters preserved love and good conscience, and the brother kept his ill-gotten gains and a bad conscience. Incidentally, my mother, who I understood would have inherited from the aunts, was not born with a silver spoon in her mouth. And therefore my sister and I had, as John Wesley said of his brother Charles, a fair escape from being a rich man. My mother's circumstances were humble. I have no information concerning her mother, save that her maiden name was Martin. It was thought that her father was an army officer, but I know only that he was seriously afflicted with what I think must have been rheumatic arthritis. My elder sister and I have markedly gouty constitutions, which is all that we inherit from our maternal grandfather. Though he told my father that some very wealthy property was in chancery, for want of proof of the death of a certain person, so, so perhaps this was a second fair escape. There are good reasons for this ignorance. I never knew my mother, or I should know more regarding her people. Her sister's husband became an ardent spiritist, on which account my father wisely discontinued intercourse with the family, before I was old enough to be interested in him. They had gone to America before I was born. At least he was in Chicago the Sunday before the great fire on October 8, 1871. For as my father told me, he stated publicly for, from the pulpit that for the sins of the city some great calamity would shortly befall it. This is not the first time that God has constrained a lying prophet to declare a coming judgment. 1 Kings 13 Satan has a limited power of foretelling. If, for example, he has been commissioned to execute a certain judgment, he can announce it in advance. But in general, the predictions of his servants are unreliable and lure into danger. My parents were both acquainted with the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour. 
before they were acquainted with each other. They first met at a religious gathering. I believe my father was on that occasion some distant help, some distinct help in her spiritual life to the then unknown lady. On his side, at least, it seems to have been love at first sight. And at a glance, and a glance at her portrait will show the reasonableness of this. My mother was a particularly sweet woman. One of their closest friends and fellow workers was William Bailey. I remember going with my father to see him many years after my mother's death. As we parted, the dear old man turned away with tears in his eyes and with a break in his voice said, He is just like his mother. Another friend who, to whom my parents were a great help in his early Christian life was Alfred Mace. His father was a celebrated prize fighter, Jem Mace, so that the youth needed special help from outside his family. After I left home at 18 years of age, Mr. Mace and I did not meet for many years. His greeting at the close of a public conference was, You are just like your mother. It was no ordinary beauty and tenderness of character that left so indelible an impression upon strong men. I have copies made by her, written neatly in the pointed script of her day of two hymns, the one expressive of joyous confidence in Christ, the other descriptive of his sufferings which made possible our joys. The former is a well-known hymn commencing. My God, I am thine, what a comfort divine, what a blessing to know that my Jesus is mine. In the heavenly lamb, thrice happy I am, and my heart it doth dance at the sound of his name. The other is a much used hymn. O Christ, what burdens bowed thy head! Our load was laid on thee. Thou stoodest in the sinner's stead. Barst all my ill for me. A victim led. Thy blood was shed. Now there's no load for me. Her copies give, gives this stanza. Her copy gives this stanza not usually printed. A flame was kindled in God's ire. O oh Christ, it burned on thee. It was a hot, consuming fire, even in the fair green tree. There did that fire feed and expire. Now it is quenched for me. In this calm assurance and strong joy, my mother lived. In a poem in a school reader, well known in my boyhood, a prisoner in France, a sailor lad says, Great was the longing that I had to see my mother. His heart and mine are one. Concerning my father's relatives, I know rather more than any of my mother's. On August 10th, 1899, being on holiday at Elfracombe, I took train to Barnstaple and Umberley. The latter village lies in a lovely North Devon valley. Having climbed the long hill that leads to the ridge south of the valley, I turned east, walked through the high Bickington onto Weeks Cross, turned back onto Barnstaple Exeter High Road, and presently reached the object of my search, the house where my father was born. I knew it by its standing at the corner where the high Bickington Lane joins the main road. Filial sentiment could not fail to be stirred at the night, but my strong total abstinence con convictions sustained a severe and wholly unexpected shock. There could be no doubt about it. However, there was the name large enough. The the Robro Arms. My beloved and honoured father was born in a country inn. I resolved to prosecute no further, to prosecute no further, 
my purposed inquiries into his ancestry. What else might not I find? Perhaps another of my forebears swung at the crossway for sheep stealing. Ancestors of sundry noble persons were hanged, drawn and quartered on various grounds. I did, however, go into the parlour, not the bar, and astonished the proprietress by asking for a glass of water and interested her by inquiring if she knew aught of a family of langs that lived there fifty years before. She had heard the name, as also my grandmother's family name, Locke, but nothing more. I reflected that sick transit Gloria Mundi and went my way. Nearby was a cottage, once the lodge at the entrance to the drive to Robro House. Here lived two elderly women, who I decided must be conscious of some degree of my father. Opposite the cottage stood a small meeting room where my father, as a tiny child, amazed the village assembly by repeating a lengthy portion of Holy Writ. After a brief time here, I assumed my walk back to Barnstaple through the glorious Devon hills and vales. Being not sure of the way I turned into a, being not sure of the way, I turned into a farmyard and inquired of a countryman working on a rick. He gave some directions in Devon dialect, which therefore were not very clear to the visitor. With the folly of a young gentleman from the city, I remarked, Well, I dare say I shall get there all right if I follow my nose. To which the yokel gave the appropriate and useful reply, Oh, yes, if you keep your nose in the right direction. I say useful reply, but for I believe it has ever since served as a salutary preservative from town conceit. My grandfather, George Lang, who for a time kept the inn, was not an altogether ordinary man. The district is not so very remote to Ex Exmoor, and he was a sort of janrid for strength. He could reap in a day twice as much as um, he could reap in a day twice as much as any other man around in his days. There were still in those parts Frenchmen I'll read that again. My grandfather George Lang, who for a time kept the inn, was not an altogether ordinary man. The district is not so very remote for Exmoor from Exmoor, and he was a sort of Jan Ridd for strength. He could reap in a day twice as much as any other man around. In his days there were still in those parts Frenchmen who had been prisoners, kept on Dartmoor, during the Napoleonic Wars. One of these, a bullying type of man, with the true cowardly instinct of his type, fastened upon my grandfather as one of the group of reapers to be the butt of his nonsense. For he saw his victim was a quiet spirit. Great bodily vigour and a gentle spirit are not a common combination. The Frenchman, a burly man, disregarded my grandfather's quietly spoken warnings and was much astonished as the rest were amused when he found himself suddenly gripped by the scuff of the neck, by the scruff of the neck in the back of his knees, his forehead knocked against his knees and himself carried bodily out of the field and dropped in the ditch with the suggestion, still quietly spoken, that it would be well if he sought work elsewhere. One evening my grandfather became heated, chasing his hat on the moor. On recovering the hat, the hat he sat for a few moments to recover breath and caught a chill. Probably a few days, few early doses of camphor or aconite would have averted the consequences, but the chill developed severely. Allopathy had not yet learned to borrow 
clandestinely from homeopathy and the fine old heroic treatment of strong and heavy measures was in force. The patient was cupped and leached and bled and blistered, purged and sal salinated in a, in a way that explains the ancient Jewish saying, He that sinneth, sinneth before his maker, let him fall into the hand of the physician. Eclus 38.15 He made a long and brave fight against the heavy odds, but as but at last even his magnificent constitution succumbed to sickness and to treatment, and death delivered him from the doctors. But this was not before he became an instance of the way in which the wisdom and power of God subdue even things evil to serve his purpose of grace. Purposes of grace. During this sickness he was brought to a saving knowledge of Christ by that very rare saint, Robert Chapman of Barnstable. My father became a prominent, exclusive brother, and for him, alas, open brethren were, ecclesiastically, the acme of dreadful evil. But Robert Chapman was an exception, to be mentioned with respect, almost affection. It was of him, indeed, as is reported that J. N. Darby himself, hearing him criticised, said, Leave Robert Chapman alone. We talk about the heavenly places, but he lives in them. And because he lived there, he could show many others the way there, by introducing them to, to him who is the way, the only way. All this was long before my birth, but my father's mother, Sarah Lang, I remember distinctly. She came to live in one of my early homes, Preston, Station Road, Sidcup, Kent, and died there. When I was in my thirtieth year, aged eighty-four, on March twenty-ninth, 1887, the jubilee year of the Great Victoria, I remember the fearful thunderstorm of that afternoon, and of how, through the drawn Venetian blinds, I watched the vivid forked lightning. Like her husband, my grandmother also was strong of body. When eighty-two years of age, taking my father's arm, she walked two and a half miles each way to the Sunday morning meeting we attended at Chislehurst. I still see her wiry form as on that walk. She was also long, strong in character, a dame of an old-fashioned type that m modern life does not commonly develop. She might have been the elderly lady who thanked God she was before, born before, nerves were invented. From trains she maintained to the last a rooted aversion. It had been only through sheer necessity that she had come come by that means from come by that means from Devon to London. We lived ten miles from London. Towards evening, she would inquire for my father. Is George Thomas home yet? She never dropped the old practice of using both Christian names. Learning he had not come, she has been known to say, I wish he was home. He will go into in those trains. They go blundering along, not looking where they are going. The Almighty has given us legs. Why doesn't he walk to town? She had been accustomed to walk ten miles to Barnstaple Market. Why should her not son not take not walk in her steps? My stepmother took to her a letter her, from her eldest daughter, who was unwell. She had gone to bed and said, Put it on the drawers, my child. I'll look at it in the morning. But, Grandma, would you not like to know how Caroline is? No, my child, if it is good news, it'll keep till the morning. If it is bad news, I'd best not know it tonight. Of these sturdy country parents, two daughters died in early middle life. One of my two earliest recollections is of being lifted, lifted up to look at an aunt in her coffin. But I was so young that whether it was Aunt Selina or Aunt Priscilla, I'm not sure. 
My father almost completed 84 years. His younger brother, Hubert, Hubert Henry, was also well into the 80s at death, and the elder sister, Caroline, lived to over 90 years. About the year 1848, a small boy of some 10 years was to be seen on a long ladder colouring the outside of the Robro arms. It was my father. The scene suggests steady nerves, strong arms and a persevering, laborious usefulness of character. The boy was father to the man. The house possessed a usefulness of character. The house possessed a grandfather clock in plain wooden case but with good brass works. The same small boy took these to pieces, which of course most small boys would do with pleasure. He cleaned it, which most boys would not take the trouble to do. He put it safely together, which few boys or men could do. A century later, the clock was still going well. For a few times, my father went to Chumley School. Doubtless the education would now be deemed elementary. But he learned to do at least three things well. To read, and he knew the word of God from end to end. To reckon, he became an accurate, competent accountant. To write, he was easily the finest penman I ever knew. Mr. John Tuke, who then kept the school, was himself a first-class penman. How often in my business days, in my own business days, when junior after junior came and went, disfiguring my books as they passed by, did I wish that they had been taught at school to write decently instead of being able, for instance, to repeat Greek verbs, Greek verbs. And with that joy, and with what joy did I welcome at last a rosy-cheeked lad from the country who wrote legibly and was clean morally. When my father was twelve, it was decided he should go to business in London. In those days, a formidable migration, amounting for the busy and the not well-to-do almost to emigration. For he had first to coach twenty-five miles to Tiverton and to spend the night there. Then, getting the train at 9 a.m., he reached Paddington at 9 a.m., 9 p.m. This whole journey is now completed in a few hours. The carriages were not comfortable. Of this wearisome day, the only incident preserved is that a woman had a baby, which was so fractious that a man growled the stupid question, Why do women have babies? And the and received from the distracted mother the tart response, If your mother hadn't, you wouldn't be here to complain. On tedious and disagreeable journeys, let the traveller remember and hold his peace. The youth entered the service of Messrs. Olney and Amsden. Retail drapers in the Old Kent Road, Mr. William Olney and Mr. Thomas Olney, became successively treasurers of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in the days of the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon. My father grew up with the business, which presently became wholesale only and removed to extensive premises in Falcon Street, E.C., those were bombed in the 1939-45 to 45 war. He led to a knowledge of Christ, one who entered the business as a young man and later became head of the firm. It speaks volumes for the character of a servant when he can bring the Lord an employer. In my young boyhood, my father was already the chief of the counting house. He served the firm for 50 years till his annual turnover was some three-quarters of a, a million pounds, and in that long period was never away a week from illness. Beginning then to feel he could not do all the, 
that his responsible and increasing duties demanded, he retired and supported himself by accountancy work for various smaller undertakings. He continued thus for twenty more years, at last relinqu relinquishing gradually one after another of his posts, until in his eighty-second year he wrote to me, for the first time, for seventy years I find myself out of employment. He was one of the num numberless instances from whose, from those Victorian days of individual freedom of how grit and integrity enabled youths to reach honourable and comfortable status without unions to help or the state to father and so to an feeble character. In his eightieth year, he had occasion to consult the late Dr. Morish, a homeopath. Disgusted with the barbarous treatment his father had received, he perceived at once the immeasurable superiority of the homeopathic system of medicine. Thus his family and great numbers of others had the benefit of homeopathy. The homeopathic principle of selecting remedies is as distinctly a law of nature as is, say, gravity, and the general rejection of it by British doctors is to their perpetual disgrace. It has been said of classical Greek that it draws a line where other languages make a blot. The same is true of homeopathy as compared with other systems of medicine. But from acquaintance with Dr. Morish, my father received a vastly superior benefit. He attended Bible readings in the doctor's house and received from the word of God what, as a member of the Church of England, he had lacked before, assurance of salvation by faith, in assurance of salvation by faith, in the atoning sacrifice of the Son of God. From that time, throughout his long life, his devotion to the Redeemer was his ruling quality. An earnest disciple was invited to make a cigar. He replied, Thank you, I do not smoke. Was invited to take a cigar. He replied, Thank you, I do not smoke. I blaze. My father might have said the same. One of my earliest recollections is of a tea to the poor and Caroline Street, a wretched neighbourhood near the South Metropolitan Gas Company's works. Mr. Afterwards, Sir Thomas Livesey, the manager of the company, built the hall privately for the benefit of their workpeople. My father was asked to help in the spiritual efforts. Many were the sinners saved. Later, he was active at a mission room in Willowbrook Road, Bermondsey, S.E. Here, too, very many were converted. He was also a leader at the Willow Road Room, Bermondsey, one of the halls of exclusive brethren. To this body Dr. Morish belonged, and in it my father remained until his death. In his later years, his generous spirit became increasingly tolerant. Indeed, from the conversions with him near the end of his life, when confinement to the house had given him long leisure for meditation in the word of God, free from distracting influences, I found that certain of his ecclesiastical views had so much changed as quite unconsciously to himself not to differ greatly from those of early brethren, before unhappy divisions took place. This is a notable testimony to a beautiful simplicity, sincerity and childlikeness of mind that was a cons conspicuous trait in his character, and which enabled him, even in very old age, to unlearn and relearn as the Holy Spirit illuminated the Holy Scripture. He was almost the last survivor of the earlier generation of that communion and was the embodiment of the chief excellencies of its palmiest days and now he is wholly free from its defects. From its defects, reverting to the mission room mentioned, 
Only a few years ago, my sister, Mrs. Skinner, met at Bexley Heath in Kent, a Christian over 90 years of age, who said that when she was, she was a young married woman, a sweet-faced lady called at the door, offered a tract and invited her to that hall. After the service, the preacher for the evening shook hands with those leaving and said to her, Do you know if your sins are forgiven? On reaching home, she said to her husband, What a strange question, the gentleman asked me. But the question provoked thought and inquiry, and before long she and her husband could answer in the affirmative. The lady was my mother, the preacher my father. It will now be see <coughs> it will now be seen with what endowment I entered life. From my paternal grandfather I inherited a constitution of constitution of unusual vigour. Looking back to my boyhood, I do not seem to remember ever being weary and might almost wonder why I used to go to rest. Doubtless, however, my elders saw good reasons for packing me off to bed. On Whit Monday in 1893, when 18 years of age, I walked from Clifton to Clevedon, thence to Portishead and back to Clifton. 26 miles of hilly country and ate only a few biscuits at Clevedon and drank a bottle of lemonade at Abbot's Lee near the end of the walk. Reaching Clifton in the evening, I finished the day well at a religious meeting. In my fortieth year, I tramped seventeen miles over the deserts of Egypt, exploring the Mokatam hills near Cairo under the hot March sun. In that land, I walked steadily for seventeen hours a day with a shade temperature of 115 degrees for days together and of 95 degrees after sunset for months at a, at a time. By contrast, in Poland, in my 51st year, 40 degrees of frost were not disagreeable. After my boyhood, I had lived a persistently strenuous life for 40 years before nature waved a warning signal, and this in spite of perhaps a dozen turns of influenza. On the other hand, from my maternal grandfather, I inherit gout, which is a perpetual saviour from the spiritual peril of strength. That affliction may be summarized in general by saying that in early manhood it can be annoying in middle life it can be in early manhood it can be annoying in middle life distracting in later years crippling it takes many challenge, many changing forms and thankful may be the sufferer and thankful may the sufferer be as long as it does not locate in one place or organ to its permanent injury. By the mitigating mercy of God, I have been able to homeop able by homeopathic medicines to reduce its intensity and to move it about all over the body, so preventing that dreaded fix fixity of residence. But I doubt if inherited and long established, gout is curable. In the full sense of the terms, save saved by the direct power of God. I am not unacquainted experimentally with that power in weakness and in sickness, and I have looked oft to him in respect of his constitutional condition, of this constitutional condition, but I have received no assurance that he thought good to relieve my ship of this ballast. His love and his will are perfect, nothing less than perfect. Happy is he who can sing sincerely. This weakness I enjoy, that cast me on thy breast. The conflicts that strength employ make me divinely blessed. I have called gout an affection rather than, as is usual, a complaint. Not that I have any affection for it, but because that only can that only can be a complaint of which one complains, 
and as the Christian is to give thanks in everything, he is to complain of nothing. If I have sufficient strength of character, it may be attributed to my relationship to my father's mother. If any softer natural qualities temper their opposites, it is doubtless because I am my mother's son. The like fearlessness which took that small boy up a ladder and the caution which enabled him to stay up safely have kept me from foolish rashness and yet have enabled me to do what some would have feared, feared to undertake. It was without any sense of danger that as a boy of ten or eleven I walked along the outward sloping parapet of the wall of a high railway bridge in Kent. The same qualities have made it to be not so formidable for me as for some to take extensive journeys alone in lands the language of which I did not know. A business love of order and a liking for sticking at a task until it is perfected are but reproductions of the excellent business habits of my father. Of the far richer spiritual inheritance, more must be said hereafter. While writing thus, I by no means forgot the direct enablings of the Holy Spirit, without whose constant and effectual inworking all natural endowments were insufficient, and indeed had been only abused and wasted. Nor do I offer any apology for describing the physical and temperamental stock in trade with which I commenced the business of life. One who inherits an estate need not be ashamed to speak thereof. It is not to a man's own credit that he inherits something, but he may and should give thanks to his creator that he starts his career with certain advantages, and if even show that he is able to use and improve the heritage, let him give to God alone all the glory for the capacity to do, so to do. And thou shalt eat and be full, and shall bless Jehovah thy God for the good land which he has given thee. Beware, lest thou say in thy heart, My power and the might of my hand had gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember Jehovah thy God, for it is he that giveth this wealth. But thou shalt remember Jehovah thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Whether those riches by be material or moral, inherited or acquired. Deuteronomy 8, chapter 8, verses 10, 17 and 18. This will suffice to show into what physical, mental and social conditions I was born by the ordering of God and to introduce my forebears and myself.